So okay, now now we are at this step. We have a small neighborhood of the point A, radius two epsilon is chosen in a suitable way in order to have these two conditions fulfilled. Derivative of f different from zero, and f of z minus alpha no um, has no so, no zeros, and this punctured disk. So <coughs> this is lesson number ten. One. Now I take the curve gamma of t to be the circle or radius epsilon. So it is inside so, of the punctured disk. This is A. The radius is 2 epsilon. So this is the circle I'm considering. And then I define sigma of t to be f of gamma of t. Okay, this is a curve where? Where it is a curve somewhere else. If this is alpha and this is sigma, I can say that sigma of t is different from alpha for any t. Is it correct? Because we are assuming that f of z minus alpha has no zero in the punctured disk, in, in the entire punctured disk, or in particular along this curve. Good. So now, uh, this is alpha. Then I take a small neighborhood of alpha here, say radius delta, so that b a alpha delta Okay, is such that B alpha delta does not intersect the curve sigma. Well, this notation is, of course, as usual, a bit, uh, there is an abuse notation in this, but what I'm saying is that there is no intersection, okay, of the image of the curve, so as a set, and the small neighborhood of delta I'm taking here in my consideration. In other words, I say there exists a delta positive such that this ball, open ball, is not intersecting the curve. In other words, okay. For any beta in this suitable neighborhood of alpha, beta belongs to the same component, to the say, same path connected component of the complement of sigma. So in our picture here, it is in the so bounded component, it could be in, a, in the unbounded component as well, but it is very close to alpha in such a way that for any beta I'm taking in this neighborhood, we are in the same neighborhood. This is important to the cal for the calculations of the index, if you remember, right? All right, so. In fact, what I'm doing here is the following. I'm calculating now this, the index with respect to sigma of alpha, which is the same as the index with respect to sigma of beta. This is because we have already proved this fact, right? If they are in the same component path connected or if you want com so in the complement of, of the curve sigma then the index is the same but how can we calculate it well this is the integral 1 over 2 pi i sorry I always forget this I apologize now 
for the past and for the future times. Uh, 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 okay, so please, when I say, well, this is because sometimes this 2 pi i is included, is, well, I, this is not an excuse, actually. Sometimes it is included in the formula, okay? So you say, well, this is the index up to uh, 2 pi i, okay? So, but this is not an excuse. Of course, it is a, it is a mistake. And the last time it was pointed I out correctly that I forgot to put a 2 pi i, but then uh, luckily I could add it before making the copies for you, okay? So you, you probably didn't notice here, but in the, in the, the, in the copies I, I gave you, it is correct. Okay, but just in case, it's not important, okay? Just we want to be uh, somehow more familiar with the, the integral part than the, the constant part, okay? All right, good. So I'm, I'm calculating this as it is expected to calculate. So the integral of a sigma of what? So I have this, right? I have d. Uh, I have sigma here, right? So I have two d minus beta or alpha, right? Well, this is alpha here, but this is beta. Okay. And what is beta? Well, what is sigma? Sigma, remember, is f composed to gamma. So when I, I write this integral, this line integral, I have to replace everything and make it somehow equivalent. Well, I write it in terms of a line integral, not a curve integral, but a line integral. So this is, if I replace sigma with this, this is precisely what I have here. So the integral over. 0, 1 of f prime of gamma t, gamma prime of t, and then I have here f of gamma t minus alpha dt. But what is this number? Well, if you look at this number, this is the number in the number of times f, of f takes the f or say f of z minus alpha is zero, is zero in a, right? So this is m, all right? On the other hand, on the other hand, this is, I write this here, one over two pi i, integral between one, zero and one of f prime gamma of t, gamma prime of t, f of gamma t minus beta dt. And remember that this is the numbers of inverse images of beta, right? And since we are assuming that f prime of z is different from zero in the punctured disk, okay, we can say that the number of zeros is m and each is different from the other because the function is injective. So what we can say now is that in a neighborhood of a value which is taken m times, which is considered as an m value, the function which is holomorphic, so we can take a small neighborhood in such a way that any point beta in this small neighborhood has m inverse images in a small neighborhood of A. Because this counts precisely the numbers of zeros of this function here inside. Right? This is the index we defined last time. So this is somehow what we have to prove. <laughs> and well, this result tells us something more, and I want to emphasize this in particular. And this goes back to. So we have the following. We have, say, graphically, we have puncture disk here of center A, then I have alpha here, and I take a small neighborhood, right, of alpha, of radius delta with the notation, right? Then we actually restrict ourselves to a small, smaller neighborhood of radius epsilon, not to epsilon, but epsilon. And what we can say is the following, then you take the 
this all right is contained in the image of the ball center at a of radius epsilon because alpha goes to sorry a goes to alpha is mapped by f into alpha then I take a small neighborhood each point in this small neighborhood is such that it has m uh, inverse images in this small neighborhood of a m distinct okay we have proven this which means which means something else since this is an arbitrarily small neighborhood of a point right that whenever u is open and f open in omega and f is holomorphic in omega then necessarily f of u is open do you see this how can I prove this? Well, to prove that something is open, it suffices to show that any neighborhood, any sorry, any point has a neighborhood contained in this. But any point in the image is in fact such that this works fine. In other words, this property means that any holomorphic function and I'm assuming that it is non-constant constant is an open function topologically a function is open if the image of an open set is open pardon me right now take for instance the function sine cosine okay cosine on the reals right cosine is very it's real analytic it's whatever you want say so infinity it's very good on the entire real line however it is bounded in between, between minus one and one and if you take some open set for instance from 0 to 4 pi huh, the image is a closed set it's not an open set okay other consequences of this simple fact simple but the term so but some in some sense we are we are considering special function so this gives you a topological property of holomorphic function so we started from say an analytic definition the existence of the complex derivation. We proved that this is equivalent to complex analyticity. We gave equivalent condition Cauchy-Riemann equations. We gave a characterization in terms of conformal mappings. Now we have also a property which is topological property for a function. This um, result uh, is also um, important for the following fact. Assume that <coughs> F is holomorphic as usual non-constant. Non-constant is somehow because constant functions are not interesting for, for the consideration we are taking, okay? Topologically, are not interesting, and for for the statement I'm I'm going to to, to prove, it's not it's not interesting. So assume that uh, so there is say uh, holomorphic. Sorry, I didn't say it in omega. Then I say that there is omega is an open sub subset of C as usual. There is no Z naught in omega such that f of Z naught is modulus greater than 
f of z for any z in omega minus z naught. So if you consider the composition, if you want, you have omega here, then here is c, this is the function f, and here you take the modules, okay? You can say that this function associate to any complex number a non-negative real number. Take the composition, okay? The complex are not ordered, but the reals are. So we simply are considering the possibility for this composition to have a maximum. This is the maximum, right? Inside omega. This is not possible. So this is how, as, as uh, it is normally mentioned, the maximum modulus theorem, and I, I will show you why. Huh? Maximum modulus theorem. Okay. So if z naught in omega is such that f of z naught for any z in omega f holomorphic, then f is constant. Or, this can be also, uh, this, this statement can have an, a larger um, formulation in the following way. Assume that omega, the, the function f, can be extended up to the boundary, continuously up to the boundary. So in this case, and omega is bounded. So the closure of omega becomes a compact subset of R2 or C, right? So for sure, this composition of two functions, this is C infinity, analytic, whatever. But this is continuous. So this composition is at least continuous. So you have a continuous function on a compact set, real valid. So definitely it has a maximum and a minimum. You have a continuous function between, assume that f can be extended up to the boundary. This is not in general true, but assume that it is holomorphic inside this bounded um, open set omega and continues up to the boundary. Okay, as a continuous function, this composition of two continuous functions, this is a continuous function, defined on the closure of the bounded omega. We are assuming that omega is bounded and the closure, of course, is closed. Okay, so it is closed and bounded, so it is compact. As a compact set, you have a function which is continuous on a compact set. It has a maximum and a minimum. So it has a maximum. So this means that the maximum cannot be in omega, but it has to be on the boundary. This is not very much surprising for those of you who have seen this same principle for harmonic functions. Okay, harmonic function cannot take any maximum inside the domain, but on the boundary. And since we, as we have pointed out that the real imaginary part of, uh, of holomorphic functions are harmonic. This is not so surprising for those of you. But, well, how can we see this? Apparently, this is something completely different from the, from the re real case. It is, in fact. And how can we see this? Well, this is quite simple. And this is a consequence of the openness of the function. So, I just draw a very elementary picture without using, invoking many other properties of holomorphic function. We know that if alpha is defined in A, it is actually defined in a small neighborhood of A, right? The definition of holomorphic function is in fact a local definition. We have to, okay, define well, it is now equivalent to analyticity, and analyticity is something which works fine in a neighborhood, 
in the sense that we have to have a, a, a positive radius of convergence over the series. Otherwise, we have just pointwise definition, right? And this is the value. Okay. So for sure, if I take a small neighborhood of A, the function f is defined in, in this neighborhood, and its image contains alpha. Right? This is true for any point inside the domain of definition. This is true, this, this kind of game is true for any A in omega. Okay, assume that f is defined in omega. Okay, take A, consider alpha as f of A, take a small neighborhood, A, omega is open, so a small neighborhood in omega, and then take its, its image. Its image contains alpha, and it's, it is like this, right? It's a neighborhood of alpha. So I can say this because we have proved that a holomorphic function is in fact open. So this is a neighbor, this is an open, say, an open neighborhood of alpha. Correct? So assume that, that Z0 of the statement is as I said, okay? So assume that Z0 in omega is such that f of Z0 is greater than f of Z. Now we have a contradiction for any Z, okay? Now we get a contradiction because then <coughs> we restrict our consideration to a small neighborhood of Z0, okay? And repeat the same picture over here, this is f of z naught. And assume that, well, I enlarge a little bit, okay? This is f of b z naught epsilon. I enlarge a little bit. What I'm saying is that, well, it, since this is an open neighborhood, there is a, <coughs> a small neighborhood of f of z naught of radius, say, delta. Hmm? So b f of z naught delta is contained in f of b of z naught epsilon, right? It's because of, of the open mapping theorem we have proved so far, right? So, but then, as you can see, so assume that you can visualize the modulus. This is the origin, okay? This is the modulus of f, the length of this segment. Well, of course, this point here has a larger modulus, right? Now, this is not because I'm, I'm drawing and I'm cheating you with these pictures. Because every time I have the value of a point inside the domain of definition of a holomorphic function, I can take a small neighborhood. I'm sure that this is in the image as well. Therefore, f of z naught cannot have the maximum modulus of all the other values of the function f. So this is a contradiction. For any point inside, this is not allowed. Right? So I consider this an important step and an important um, say geometric characterization using the topological properties of holomorphic functions. So these functions cannot take, have the modulus which takes a maximum inside the domain of definition. So it's very different from, from the real case. Okay. Now, <coughs> after studying the zeros, let me just mention that we want to study the singularities. We have already encountered some singularities, okay? We have noticed that when you divide a function times something, which is a polynomial, we have to 
to be sure that the function, the, the quotient is well defined, right? So that since we are dealing with complex numbers, for instance, if you have a polynomial dividing something else, and polynomial has as many zeros, as many roots as its degree, so for sure this quotient, this ratio, is not defined whenever the polynomial vanishes. And this, uh, in, in the complex number, means that it always vanishes in as many points as the degree counting the multiplicity of them. So I want to, to, to go into the details of the studies of singularities a little bit more. Okay, and using the tools we have developed so far for the study of the zeros. So for each zero of our homomorphic function, we have defined a multiplicity, right? So in principle, we want to extend this to the singularities, and we will see that this is not always possible. Okay, so first, definition. A function has an isolated singularity at A in omega F. F is holomorphic in in a small neighborhood of omega, but uh, so in a small neighborhood of A in omega, but it is not defined in A. Okay? For instance, as an example, 1 over z is defined for any z different from 0, but in 0 is not defined. Okay? So, and it is in fact holomorphic, at in what I can take as epsilon, the, the radius, uh, the which, uh, whatever I like, but well, this is a singularity. Another singularity, apparently, is this. You take, remember the exercise. This is not defined in zero for the same reason. Okay, this is a holomorphic function, but this is, like here, a ratio of a function, of a holomorphic function and a polynomial, and this polynomial vanishes at zero. But, as most of you, because I, I haven't checked all the exercises, but most of you have noticed, then this function has, in fact, a power series expansion also in zero. And so, this function, in fact, is holomorphic also in zero. Well, it is not defined so as to be clarified somewhere, somehow, right? Well, it is not defined at the beginning, but then in some cases it can be actually extended also to singularity. And so, in fact, the first definition is the following. So we, can classif we start classifying the singularities. I would say that, so this is the definition again, A is uh, removable. Singularity. So we are taking a singularity and we are considering a, um, a special class of singularities, the so called removable singularities for F, F. There exist a holomorphic. function G 
defined in a neighborhood of A, okay, such that f of z is equal to g of z in the punctured disk. Okay, so this is the situation. We have a singularity, and the singularity in general defines, uh, is, is defined for a function which is holomorphic in a small neighborhood of this point, but not at this point. And then we say, well, this singularity is in fact removable when we can have a holomorphic and so complex analytic function which agrees with the function in this small neighborhood, but not in A, and is actually also holomorphic in A. Well, this is not very much surprising because the example, so the example I gave you before is in fact an example of a removable singularity. You can consider the expansion you have, you have calculated in your exercise to be an analytic function defined also in A. It agrees with this function here, okay, in a small neighborhood of zero, and the identity principle guarantees that this function is in fact the same and can be extended. How can we characterize this fact? Why, and this two very simple example, one has to be considered different from EZ minus one. Or, so we have, you know, the same denominator. And this, in this case, I can extend this, apparently you cannot. Hmm? So, uh, I have this proposition. Um, and yes. Uh, as, as usual, I'm assuming that the singularities are isolated, okay? So that I can make this consideration in small neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. A is a removable singularity. For F, F and only if a limit as z tends to a of z minus a times f of z is zero. How can we see this? Have we encountered something very close to the, this statement? Well, we have used this condition once in the so generalized Gursa theorem. Okay, we assumed that, well, the function was not defined, but with this condition, which guarantees, for instance, what? That the function is bounded at A. In a small neighborhood of A, it is bounded. It cannot, right? So, <clears throat> In fact, I have this alternative proposition okay assume that uh, assume that f has bounded so that modulus of f is bounded in. And it's not in, well, put epsilon here, right? In a small neighborhood of, or in the punctured disk, small neighborhood of A, or the singularity itself, then A is a removable singularity for F, right? So this explains why zero here is not a removable singularity. Here, zero is a removable singularity. So this, this result is also known as, sometimes it's called Riemann theorem. But it's not the Riemann theorem. There are many Riemann theorems. Okay, so I will not use this 
theorem is that much. But well, take this function here to be defined like this. And h of a z is 0 when z is equal to a. So, I define this. I define this function. Well, this is a function, it's a complex value function. Now, I have to just to right. So, f is defined in the neighborhood, z minus a is defined wherever I want, and I, ext I well, I, I define this function. Okay? What happens if I have this? Well, I'm assuming that the function f is in fact bounded in a neighborhood of a, right? This is zero, correct? Because this is bounded. Take the see so if you want take the the modulus of the product. This tends to this is infinitesimal and this is bounded, so tends to zero. So the function h is continuous, at least. Hmm? Good. So outside of zero, of, uh, sorry, of a, it is also analytic. In fact, this is well a product of a polynomial and a holomorphic function. So it is holomorphic. What? about the derivative at a. Is it possible to define a derivation, a composite derivation of h at a? Well, we have to calculate it. Mm -hmm. So I calculate what the limit of uh, h of z minus h of a, which is defined in 0, z minus a, as z tends to a. Correct? Well, this is 0. because h of a is 0. So it is the limit as it tends to a, z minus a times f of z. You say this because we have z minus square, right? So this explains why this condition, okay, equal to 0 guarantees that H is holomorphic and not in the puncture disk, but in the ball center at A of radius epsilon, because the derivative is defined. See? Now, this, if you want, is another way to see that F can be extended also. So, it can be extended. So, f and h are not the same function. They are defined with this relation. But if I write the expansion of h of z, we have the following. Have, sorry. Sum k greater or equal to 0, the expansion in a can be taken. Okay? So I take bk z minus a k because it is holomorphic. Right? Then, then, then I have that h of z is z minus a squared of f of z, where? And, well, this is for any z and b a epsilon, but this is in d a epsilon, so in the punctured disk. In other words, I have that. So, uh, I consider g of z to be, I'll define this, same coefficient of h, bk, and then I take z minus a, uh, k minus 2. Is that correct? Mm, slice plus 2, right? Wow. <laughs> uh, 
this is h plus plus 2 right plus 2 of course hmm? but this is another function which is holomorphic in a huh? and well I notice that g of z is f of z whenever z is in in uh, uh, the punctured disk <coughs> and this extends f right because we have that h of z is summation of b k z minus a k and h of z is z minus a squared times f of z right so I have an extra two here which cancel extra two and so they coincide right so in fact this this is the definition of a removable singularity we have a holomorphic function g defined on the entire well g is holomorphic in B A epsilon and this is explicitly written in fact this is the power expansion at A right furthermore G and F coincide outside of A in a small neighborhood in the puncture disk so A is a removable singular according to the definition so this is so if you want an analytic rephrase version of the Gurusa theorem again Remember that we have that uh, integral over a closed curve mm, is of a function is zero over a rectangle. We prove this, and then we said, well, a rectangle without some points, a finite number of points, and then we extend it from this to the case of a disk of a domain. Uh, okay by using the rectangle properties of the Gursa theorem and the extended Gursa theorem. Okay? When we have that integral over a closed curve gamma is zero, when then we define the primitive and then we have holomorphicity. Okay? And this is another another way to say this. Now what I'm saying is the following fact, which is not a statement to be proved but <coughs> a fact I'm saying it uh, given a holomorphic function f in d a epsilon one and only one of the following possibilities must occur. One, A is a removable singularity, which will be of no interest in some sense because it's like considering a fake singularity function can be extended if you want and holomorphically extended to this singular so it's not very interesting second there exists a minimal n greater than 1 such that the limit as it tends to a of z minus a to the power n of f times f of z is bounded in a neighborhood power hood of a and finally there is no minimal n with this property. So for any n, 
c minus a to the power n times f of z is unbounded. in say b i epsilon okay so we have characterized if we want this is equivalent to say to saying that the limit as z tends to a of z minus a times f of z is zero so in particular this is a, this is another characterization but either you have a well, when i say minimal when i mean the following i mean that if i take n minus 1 instead of n, this product, this limit, when I take the limit of z minus a, n minus 1, f of z, is, is unbounded, right? So minimal means the, the smallest stand such that this, uh, this occurs. Good. So examples, again. So in fact, this is not a, uh, well, let me say, again, this is not a statement. I'm just saying, okay, if it's not the case, this is the other possibility. Now, I want to show you that all the cases may, may, uh, may occur, and then I try to characterize them. So the first is already somehow clearly justified and characterized in terms of the limit as z tends to a of c minus a times f of z equal to zero, we will include. Huh? And then we'll study the two other singularities. I'll show you one example of the first case and one example of the second case. Well, one, one is quite simple. So, 2, and I take z minus a to the power n, right? Take n, <laughs> and if you take n minus 1, I multiply this by this, and of course, this is like. 1 over z minus a to the power 1 or k, whatever. And so this, this is unbounded, but then for n, and then for any n greater than this n, the, the limit is bounded. It's actually 0 for n strictly greater than this n here. The surprising fact is that, that we have also functions with the, the, for which it is impossible to make the product of z minus a to whatever n you want times f of z bounded. And the example, the classical example is the following. And remember the exponential as um, power expansion 1 plus z plus z. Huh? So 1 half plus. So this function is, in fact, uh, not defined in 0. But if you take, so a is 0, right? So the singularity is in 0. Here the singularity is in a. But well, I can take 1 over z minus a if you want. OK, but 0 is just for, for, for the sake of simplicity is taken, OK? So what I have to consider, I have to consider this, right? which corresponds in, in the statement I gave you before to z minus a, okay, z, a is 0. And this, and, and this is, well, it is z to the power n plus z to the power n minus 1, you see, plus, plus. And this part here is a polynomial up to the degree n, the coefficient, sorry, to the, to the nth coefficient, to the nth, sorry, not coefficient, but the nth term in the power c expansion. This is plus 1 over n factorial. Then I have something which is a polynomial. And here, I, the, the, the powers increases. Huh? So I have uh, 1 over n plus 1, and then z plus, sorry, factorial, plus 1 over n plus 2, z squared plus, and so on and so forth. So this part here is, in fact, ban it as z tends to 0, but this is not. And you can take the n as large as you want. You can always find infinitely many terms in the power expansion of e to the power i, 1 over z, 
which have this property. So this is an, ex an example of the case 3, say, and this is an example of case 2. Okay, so just uh, for the sake of uh, terminology, uh, we say that case 2 occur, if case 2 occurs, case 2 occurs, the singularity is called pole. Okay? And the N associated is the order. Case 2 means not this example specifically, but the example listed in here, in this fact, okay? So, if there is a minimal N such that this is bounded, then A is a pole, and this N here is called the order of the pole. Whereas, if case 3 occurs, the singularity is called essential singularity. And I have just shown you that all three cases may actually occur. Now let me, okay, this is something there. Now let me characterize in this proposition the two singularities poles and essential singularity, pole and essential singularity. Because remote singularities, as I said, are not very much interesting for us. Um, but uh, I have also characterized them. So if you, if you know something like the, the limit, like so if you know that the function is bounded in a neighborhood of the, of the singular, then necessarily the singularity is removable singularity, or if you want its limit, as it tends to the singularity of C minus A of the function, is in fact zero, okay, equivalent. Now, <coughs> uh, so this is the proposition for the other two cases I'm interested in. Assume that F is holomorphic in D A epsilon, that is equivalently F has a singularity and A. Now, case 2 is equivalent to say, so <coughs> case 2 means that the limit as it tends to A of Z minus A n f of z is bounded. So there exists an n such that this is true. This occurs if and only if there exist c1, cn complex numbers, cn different from zero such that, I continue here, okay, such that then I take this, f of z minus sums from 1 to n of ck, z minus a, k. So this is another function, okay, has a removable singularity at a. And we know what it means. Okay? And then I say case 3, that is to say that there is no n such that the limit as it tends to a of z minus a to the power n of f of z 
is bounded. So this characterizes the, 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 the singularities regarded as poles, and this the essential singularities. This is interesting. And for any positive R, the image of, sorry, D A R, I take its closure topologically, this is C. So it is dense. Huh? So equivalently, this can be said like this. The image of any open neighborhood punctured neighbor of A is dense in C. And this part of the theorem of the proposition I'm going to, to show you is in fact quite well known result which has a, also uh, an extension but is known in this version like the Casorati Weissler theorem. So that I will recall it here. Casorati sounds very Italian, family name, Weierstrass theorem. To be more precise, the, this statement, this part of the statement is what is commonly known as Kaisvarati Weiser's theorem. That is to say that, in, that the image of a neighborhood, a punctual neighborhood of an essential singularity is, in, is dense in C. Okay? This is just a statement. I don't want to, to, to say that it is obvious to see this. It's quite surprising, okay? The image is up to some, okay? So let us go to the proof. The proof is quite simple, actually. So I want to give you the idea of the proof. As I said, there are three possibilities. A removable singularity, pole, essential singularity. So removable singularity means that well, we, are, we are dealing with something which is a fake singularity. So we are dealing with the holomorphic function, no singularity. So what I'm saying is, assume that what is stated and point in Casorati Weistra theorem is wrong, is false. So by contradiction, assume that the image of a small neighborhood of, uh, of uh, an essential singularity, of a singularity, is not dense. What, what happens? So I assume by contradiction assume no, oh, not by contradiction, but assume, okay. in some sense by contradiction, but assume. Well, if, I, 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 if I'm proving that if B, sorry, if C is not, uh, if C is not um, fulfilled, then if B occurs, I'm not saying something which is in contradiction, but okay. This is by contradiction to, in, when you just proved Casolati vice that theorem, so say, yeah. take an essential singularity and assume that the neighborhood of this singularity has not an image which is dense in C. Okay. So assume there exists a positive R and a positive delta such that, and exists W in C, such that, well, f of z minus w as modulus greater of delta, sorry, as z belongs to d bar. This inequality means that I'm assuming that there exists a point such that the image 
of the puncture disc centered at A of radius R, and there exists also this, uh, is far away from this point W. So it's not dense. It, there is some distance. There is some open set. Okay. So I'm assuming this. This is F of D A R. And if I also add the closure, I'm still far away. Okay, so I'm assuming that the image of the puncture open disk center at A of radius R is not dense. So I'm sure that this function here is well defined and holomorphic in D A R. Why? Because, well, F is holomorphic, right? This function G of Z, 1 over F of Z minus W, is well defined for any Z in here because this difference has a modulus greater than delta, which is positive. So this f, <coughs> this means that f of z minus w never vanish. Furthermore, it is uh, composition, if you want. It's the ratio of holomorphic function. It is holomorphic. But we also know from this is the same inequality that g of z has a modulus more than 1 over delta. So it is bounded. Correct? So G is holomorphic in punctured disk and bounded. So this implies that G has a removable singularity at A. Correct? We are saying that G has a singularity at A, but G is bounded, then G has a removable singularity. Okay, assume that okay, G of A is different from zero. There are two possibilities. Either G of A is zero or G of A is different from zero. Now if G of A is different from zero, then then G of z is different from 0 for any z in, I'm sorry, then I can consider f of z minus w 1 over g of z in its neighborhood of a. Huh? Correct? And therefore, I have that f of z is w plus 1 over g of z. OK? Then f is bounded in a neighborhood of A, or if you want, or F can be extended, extended to B. A R. Right from this. That is to say, F then F has a removable singularity at A. Now, consider the case G of A 
is equal to 0, how can we write it equivalently? The g z is z minus a to the power whatever m times g1 of z. Right? Because we are characterized the zeros of holomorphic. G is holomorphic. Okay? And z minus a to the power n is the factor I can take out from g of z. And I also say that g1 of a is not 0. It's not 0 at a, but after reducing my neighborhood, is not 0 in a neighborhood of a, right? So in a suitable neighborhood of A, G1 is not 0. G1 of Z is not 0. So that I can define H of Z to be 1 over G1 of Z. Therefore, I have F of Z minus W is 1 over g of z, which is 1 over z minus a to the power m times 1 over g1 of z. Or, if you want h of z after, uh, sorry, uh, um, over z minus a to the power m. Okay? This is just not just rephrasing and changing the name, but because g1 is not 0 in a suitable neighborhood of A, this function, function h is holomorphic. And the same neighborhood of A. Okay? g1 of z is not 0. This is a holomorphic function. So that I can have that f of z minus w is h of z times z minus a m. But if f, sorry, if h is holomorphic, write h of z in its power expansion center at a. Summation, say bk, z minus a to the power k. We are just using the definition of holomorphicity. In other words, I have that f of z, which is w plus h of z over z minus a to the power m is w plus <coughs> some B of k, same coefficient, but then z minus a, k minus m has to be considered because of this ratio here. All right? So I have w constant plus, then I have p0, z minus a to the power m plus b1, z minus a to the power m minus 1, divided, of course. Huh? Then I have Bm. Then I have here k greater than m, Bk, z minus a to the power k minus m. And this is a holomorphic part, and this is not, as you see. Huh? This is not holomorphic, nay. However, I have defined after gluing together the coefficients, a holomorphic function, when I remove this, so I say that f of z minus w, w plus bm minus b naught of z minus a to the power m minus, minus bm minus 1 minus a, z minus a, 
is summation of k p k so after after removing this part well this can be put also here right cancel here so after removing a finite number of factors of this form of, of, of sorry of uh, summons of this form coefficient over z minus a to power but only a finite number I obtain that the function f is in fact holomorphic that is point two so if the function fails to have image of any small neighborhood dense in C then necessarily there exists C naught well B naught B M and so with this not one uh, one is not that this is not uh, zero right otherwise see, if they are all zero then we have a removable singularity And in this case, F has a pole, as you can easily see. Okay, so this part here is called principal part part of F in A in the pole. Okay. And this completes the proof of Calzorati Weistra theorem. As I said, this is not the most generic version of Calzorati Weistra theorem, but this is some other statements which are related to Calzorati Weistra theorem. So Calzorati Weistra theorem is like this, but I can say more. I say, assume that, okay, this is a theorem. F has. Uh, uh, an isolated singularity and A and there exist two points in C such that the image of any puncture disk center at A is contained in C minus two points, these two points. So we are saying something more, more precise compared to casualty Weistra theorem, okay? We are assuming that the image of a puncture disk is not simply dense, but it omits mo at most two points, okay? Then necessarily either F has a removable singularity or F has a pole in A. And this is the famous big Picard theorem. Which is very, very deep and interesting in some sense. So <coughs> Uh, the fact that the image is dense, the, uh, the image of a small neighborhood of an essential guy is dense, is of course not as precise as Big Picard theorem. It tells you that just omitting two points suffices to have uh, either a singularity, which is a pole, or a movable singularity. In particular, now there is this interesting version of the Picard theorem, which is called the little. Picard theorem and states the following. Assume that f is an entire function 
Remember that entire means holomorphic in the entire plane. And assume that the image of the plane, so that is, is C minus two points. Then F is constant. Which is hard to see now. <laughs> it is strange. Do we have example of functions which are somehow extremal for, for this condition? In a sense that it is not constant, but entire, and omitting just one point. Well, we do have it. Entire and omitting just one point, the exponential. No, no, no. I'm, I'm talking about C, not, not two points in the extended plane. Otherwise, the statement should require three points equivalent, sorry, infinite and two extra points. Uh, well, the complex exponential is an entire function, and it omits only the point zero. Okay. Cannot omit any other point because of the little Picard theorem, otherwise it would be constant. It's not <laughs> okay? <laughs> and which is not interesting. Well, not interesting. It's not possible. It's not interesting. It's not possible. I'm not saying that this is anything you can say, anything you can prove by yourself <laughs> right now with the with the instrument, the tools we have so far developed. But I can say that, well, this is somehow related to topology more than to analysis. And if we have time at the end, maybe I give you just sketchy ideas related to this. This is a simply connected domain. This is not. You might say, oh, well, this is not surprising. Also, the case exponential. You have C and C minus one point, which is not simply connected. But in one case, we have, in case of exponential, we have a billion fundamental domain, fundamental, sorry, groups associated to the domains. The trivial and Z. Huh? And here we have Z, free product Z, so it's not a billion. This is somehow the reason why all this stuff is, uh, it cannot be compared, okay? Which is strange, you know? So very topological, far away notions come in and interfere with analysis, complex analysis. But I hope this is also somehow challenging and fascinating you. I wanted to, to well, this is not uh, in a standard course something you can afford, okay, with simple, simple tools, as I said. But it is interesting to, to mention it, just to give you, uh, I hope, a deeper insight of the subject, okay? So this, if you want, is uh, related to Liouville theorem. But Liouville the theorem, uh, so the, 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 the conclusion is the same, right? If we have something, then, okay, it's bounded, okay, bounded. Bounded is, of course, means that it omits more than two points. So this is a, Liouville is a consequence. But the proof of Liouville depends entirely on Cauchy estimates. So it's something related to analysis. Well, where here, the, the fact depends on topology more than analysis. Just to say that it, the, the, the complex analysis, of, even in one complex variable, is a very interchanging material for, uh, and a good training for many, for many disciplines, okay, in mathematics. Okay, I stop here, and so next time we continue considering singularities and studying the singularities and related stuff. Thank you.